And I brought them off, so since the last time you guys met, so if you have any questions about it, let me know. Second, motion. Second, we pay the queen. They presented. Any further discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same. That passed unanimously. Okay. Well, Alan, I'm going to kind of turn this over to you at this point, too. Okay. I'm going to turn it over as well. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> we have uh, two, two significant projects to discuss this morning. Uh, the first being uh, the Rail Connect Business Park and updating a couple of different aspects of that project, and the second being the Gateway Park. So uh, Jim passed out a, uh, uh, an overview here of the uh, discussion items for the Rail Connect Park. And uh, I guess, Jim, if you could give us an update on the progress sure. of the... Uh, yeah, I'm going to set up uh, these drawings here so we can kind of follow along what's been done. I'm trying to find the best spot here. I believe last time we met, construction was just kicking off out here. But what's been done since our last meeting is um, Fleming Excavating has installed all of the uh, gravity sanitary sewer for the project and that gravity sanitary sewer extends from the proposed lift station on county road 300 south north to rail connect drive and then west along rail connect drive uh, to just past the triad parcel that gravity sanitary is all installed um, storm sewer has been installed from the gangwar drain here at the bridge north to county road 300 makes a jog um, a little bit to the west across county road 300 into the detention basin there's a small amount of work that still needs to be finished in the detention basin um, and they're waiting until we get drier weather so they can actually get in there and do that there's a manhole cover on the south side of 300 is that the there is um, right here where the storm sewer turns the corner and there's another manhole just a little bit to the west again. Um, water main, Fleming has begun installation of the water main. Um, they've installed the water main up both sides of the triad parcel here and here. And they've installed the water main along the south of the triad parcel along Rail Connects Drive. This week they should be installing water farther to the east towards County Road 600. Um, as far as the force main goes, uh, Fleming started to install the, the force main north of the, uh, north of the railroad um, towards US 30 earlier this week. They've run into some problems with interference from the electrical substation there with their equipment, and they're trying to work those out with our AMC. So they're, they're holding off on that right now. Um, they may uh, slide back down to the, uh, to the south portion of the project and install the force main um, from the proposed lift station to County Road 600 and start going north. Um, the jack and bore across the railroad, um, as you can see here, we have a water and force main crossing of the mainline uh, CSX tracks. We also have a crossing with our sanitary force main of this industry spur to the north. We have permit approval, engineering approval from CSX for these crossings. What CSX is doing is drafting the agreements for those permits, which once we get those, Andy and I will evaluate those, and the city of Columbia City will actually be the owner of the utilities and will be signing those agreements. I told you wrong. I misunderstood that one. I thought we had Um, <clears throat> paving, all the pavement work for Oak Neck Drive, um, 
intersection work here, that will all be done um, as better weather comes along. Um, another thing we wanted to talk about today, so that's the progress on Rail Connect to this point. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, cost authorizations for different items that have come up. Jim, uh, real quick on the rail, um, and I do want to point out, and Jim and Andy put in a lot of time uh, interfacing with CSX, um, and the engineering approval was the important piece we've been waiting on for we've been waiting on five or six months, mid-December. Uh, the, the applications were initially approved or I'm sorry, submitted in October yeah. of last year, so um, you know we've all, all three of us have made contacts at CSX. So having an engineering approval, I mean, I know we still have to get through the, uh, the, the actual forms, but um, that was a significant step. And in the last couple of months, I mean, I'd say we've probably been in contact with them at least once a week, if not more. It's just been a, on average, two yeah, times a week. It's just been a really frustrating process. Any questions on the progress of the park this far? The only thing I would like to say, Jim and I have been going to the construction meetings, uh, but I'm really pleased with Fleming. They have gotten on this. There's been a couple valves of back, I can't remember the name of it, but Jim said he has installed them. But they have really been good and I guess, quote, energetic in getting these lines in. So uh, I hadn't worked with them before, but I'm really pleased with what they're doing. They and Fleming has actually flip-flopped several items in their schedule to work around this railroad permitting issue. They originally were going to do that before they started the storm sewer uh, or the water main. So they've been really good to work with in working around this this issue. Jim, don't you think they? Oh yeah, I, I mean they've kept their crews when the weather was permissible, working and and by like like both of you said, it, moving projects and. And, and looking ahead of what can be done while we're we don't want it to be stopped and that the other thing uh, Jim might say is that we uh, did get uh, talk to Mark Roach and and he talked to his fire chief and uh, and uh, I think we put you in, in connection with the assistant chief for the hookup mm -hmm. so they can run what they call a pig back through the sewer line and the Union Township Fire Department is willing to, to do that so uh, and it takes a special connection for that, so we yeah. we got those things uh, okayed also. And that that pig that Mr. Argerbright mentions is, it's a plug that they actually send through the force main line from the lift station to the downstream receiving manhole, and that cleans the line. That will probably be done once or twice a year, and the fire department's agreed to help out with that. Now, Jen, this isn't a real pig. <laughs> Don't get Peter on us or something. <laughs> I wanted to say too about Fleming. I didn't know they kept turning in paperwork for how many hours and what they were paying everyone. And I just started a folder for them. Okay. Well, the union labor called the other day and wanted to know because that was a fitted out job and it came in very handy. So good, their yeah. paperwork has been turned in good too. So good. not only are they doing good work, but yeah. they turned in the paperwork I needed when the union whatever called in and wanted the paperwork so that's Great. another kudos to them because I wouldn't have known where to start mm -hmm. if they hadn't have done that good so I that's, think that's normal but when you go to get bids again that's a good thought yes. <coughs> okay I'd like to jump over um, to some additional cost authorizations when we bid this project we set up a $75,000 work allowance contingency allowance uh, from which money could be pulled for any items that come up during construction. Um, and I've put together a list on the outline that I passed out yeah. of different items that, we're, that we will be looking at uh, additional cost. Some of these we intentionally pulled out of the bid knowing that these costs would come up later to avoid any markups from the contractor. Um, so and the, sorry, the $75,000 bid allowance was bid by the contractor, that amount was put into their bid. That amount is in the bid, yep. I don't know if that's in their little lump sum bid, but that was included in their line item. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of the costs are inspectors and flaggers for the railroad work when that's done, when the jack and bore is done. We don't know from the railroad yet what those costs will be. Um, geotechnical testing. This is um, 
GME testing has been authorized to go out there, uh, test the subgrade before they do any paving, um, test the backfill of the utilities where we cross the roadways, make sure we're getting good compaction, um, test the asphalt and the concrete when that goes in. Um, so all of this construction materials testing, um, it's usually a good idea for the owner to hire someone to do that instead of the contractor. So obviously they need to represent your interests. Um, so this is another cost that will come up. That when, uh, when we put that fill into that road, that was checked pretty regularly uh, as you put it in there. When Correct. It, so yep. it should be, should be right. Yep. Um, gas main installation. As part of the project, uh, there will be a gas main extended west from County Road 600 along the, I believe, the south side of, um, of Rail Connect Drive, right along here. Again, to where Rail, Rail Connect Drive will have a temporary cul-de-sac installed. Um, the costs for this gas main will be pulled from that work allowance. Uh, one thing which I did want to talk about a little bit today is the sizing of that gas line. Um, we obviously know what the demands for gas are from triad metals. We don't know what's going to go in to these other available lots through the park. The way that we handled this, um, kind of our, our concept for the overall park on all of the utilities was a park similar in size and magnitude to Park 30. Um, we also took a look at the availability of water and sewer infrastructure nearby and based the sizing of our lines on the existing infrastructure that we're tying into. So this park is set up for an infrastructure similar in size to Park 30. Park 30 is a three inch gas line. Um, and that would be more than adequate to serve facilities similar in nature to Triad Metals or anything you see in Park 30. But if you see a project similar in size to Project Frost, which was a prospect that we had back in December. Um, they had an incredibly high gas demand that would have required a six inch high pressure line um, run back into the park at a very significant cost. Um, so in terms of sizing the gas main for the park at this point in time, we have two options. We can go with a line similar in size to Park 30 that would handle any normal developments that would come in or if we really are confident that we might get a large project like the Project Frost, we could go ahead and look at a six inch gas main. One thought on that that I would like to point out is if a Project Frost came in, we would need to upsize the sanitary sewer system and make some improvements to the water system. Because of that, it probably makes sense to simply go with a three inch gas line now and upgrade it later if we have to. Oh, and that was a pretty unusual business, wasn't it? Yeah, um, in some regard, it, uh, it may have steered us you know, a certain direction of thinking that we're, we're going to get projects out that magnitude. But I think to Jim's point, I mean, uh, something like that comes, comes to Whitley County, it's going to require upsizing the sewer and water as well. So we're already going to be there. Um, improving infrastructure uh, if a project like that comes forward. So I've had a few others have responded to since um, at the state level and also from the partnership where you know, it's more of a, uh, I don't want to say standard, but typical manufacturing operation where you're using natural gas for, for heating, uh, for space heating, a lot less, less requirement. So, What's the cost differential? I don't have the cost on the six inch line. I do know that, uh, I do know we were looking at 12 to $15 a foot for the three inch line. My, my inclination would be that it would probably be twice that for a six inch. Um, there's also the cost of uh, a regulator at the intersection of the service line in the main. And the cost of a regulator for a six inch high pressure would be significantly more than a regulator for a three inch um, normal operating pressure gas line. That sticking with the three inches probably. Okay. Um, other costs. Um, the cost for uh, associated with the jack and bore, there is an electrical line um, 
running very close to our path for the force main at this industry spur crossing. There will probably be costs associated with either bracing that electrical line, excavating and pulling it out of the way, or potentially you may even have to move it around these bore pits, which you need to install the jack and bore. Um, those costs we intentionally held out so that the so that the commission could work directly with REMC and avoid any markups from the contractor on that. Signage for the park. Um, if you look on the color handouts that I gave you, um, there should be a sheet that says Rail Connect Signage. And on that sheet, we show two potential sign locations. One on County Road 600 East at the entrance to the park. That would be, let me get back to this other sheet. That would be a sign located somewhere in this vicinity on either, on either side of the uh, Rail Connect Drive intersection. The other proposed sign location would be all the way to the north. You can't even see US 30 on this page, but at the intersection of County Road 600 and US 30. That would be um, a sign along the highway to indicate the location of the park. The other sign at the entrance would be a nice monument sign um, featuring the park. Alan and I have met with two different sign companies um, and given them uh, some of our ideas uh, on the signs and asked them to put together some concepts which they will prepare in the next couple weeks and we can get back to, to the commission and show you those sign concepts. Um, the concepts that we requested, we told them to base it on a budget of 15000 per sign. The sign at Park 30 along US 30 was in between thirty dollars and $40,000. So we're not talking a sign quite that big, but still a, a significant sign for that amount of money. Talking to local sign makers? Talk to um, Baldus, Baldus Company in Fort Wayne um, and Fort Wayne Custom Signs. I believe, Alan, were you going to talk to Johnson Brothers? Okay. On the, um, the gas line, the gas main installation, would that work be done by the utility? Yes. Okay. The, the utility does need someone with authority from the Redevelopment Commission, um, probably whoever is in charge of the account, to call in and actually place that order. I don't know who that would be, and I would be more than happy to help out with that. Um, maybe we could do a conference call with them uh, if they have any questions, technical questions on the line itself. Um, but as far as the account information, they need someone um, from the commission to actually call that in because uh, because the, the county is going to be the owner of that line. So all of these additional things are not. Uh, None of this work being done by Fleming. Um, Fleming will be coordinating a lot of this. Okay. But the railroad flyers and inspectors they'll coordinate with the railroad. The geotechnical installation <clears throat> or geotechnical testing that's being done by GME. Uh, the gas main will be done by NIPSCO. There might be some prep work done by Fleming. Mm -hmm. um, the REMC costs, REMC. Um, again, Fleming might help with that, with pulling it out of the way if they can, and so forth. Um, the only reason I ask is because in doing this, we have to be careful a little bit with the integrity of the bid process. So I mean, if we're just paying stuff that our bills, you know, flagger, that's a bill, and the testing, and if we're paying the utility to put in the gas line, that's just a bill they can pay by voting. Instead but it, of pulling it out of the work allowance. Yeah, or, or either way. Mm -hmm. But, well, that's, I, I guess I had kind of a follow-up question on the work allowance. Is that, that work allowance, that 75000 is that... That was bid into the project by Fleming. I mean, that, that money's not coming out of Fleming. That, that was um, a requirement of the bid. We right. set that for all of the all of the bidders had to. That was just part of the bid for all of the bidders. I understand. I just don't understand where the seventy-five thousand dollars is coming from. I mean, is that they? You said Fleming, you're going to have to expend seventy-five thousand dollars on these things that come up, or 
how is it addressed in the bid? That's money coming from the commission as these items come up. Okay. So if I'm Fleming doesn't have the money, we still got it. Right. But it, it's con these these things were contemplated in the bid. Yes, that's why. I mean, that's why we put the seventy-five thousand in there because we knew these things would come up. I, you know, the for example, the RMC costs for bracing the uh, electrical line at the Jack and Boar location. Mm -hmm. We did explicitly tell them don't include this um, in in your other bid items. Mm -hmm. um, so they probably did not call RMC and get a cost on that because mm -hmm. they knew it would come out of we'll the work allowance. The right. Account. Right. Any additional work we need out of Fleming, mm -hmm. we'll just have to do the change order just to, to meet with the integrity of the bid. We can't, we don't want to, if it's work that Fleming should be doing, I don't want to hold it out and then pay somebody else directly. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Andy, I'll copy you on all of our um, change orders and okay. work change directives and all of that. I got a call the other day from I don't know who about uh, they found an electric line that's much deeper than they anticipated, and they're going to have to dig down to it. They did. Told them to it. They did it. Um, there is a uh, flip back to the other page. Once we get north of the railroad with that force main crossing, there's my page. Um, once we get north of the railroad, all of this force main is to be installed by directional drill instead of open cutting a trench, putting the line in and backfilling it. Um, and there are a lot of utilities down through here serving the industries on either side of the road. Um, one of these electrical lines right here is a lot deeper than was anticipated. So because of that, they're a lot closer to it with their force main than what they thought they were gonna be. So what they're going to have to do is actually dig down to create a small excavation to the electrical line. So when they're sending the directional drilling um, equipment through there, they can see, make sure they're not gonna hit the electrical line. Um, we also looked at just lowering or raising the force main itself. Can't raise it because we won't have enough cover. We can't lower it because it's getting really deep for their machine. Um, so what they're gonna do is actually dig down to this electrical line um, and have that open when they cross that. That's what he asked me about, was that excess digging, that's not gonna be a, I told him to go ahead and do it, he didn't think it would be a very expensive project. I think they're, I, when I talked to him, he didn't know. The guy out in the field isn't gonna be the guy who sets the final price, but he estimated around $500. And that was actually one of the items I had on here was um, item eight underneath cost authorizations was force main depth potholes. Um, I guess getting through the last couple cost authorizations here, um, the casing length at this north rail spur, based on the agreement that has been sent to us by Rail America, this casing length we feel needs to be extended to meet the intent of their agreement so that we stay, they have a requirement to stay 50 feet away from their tracks with any, um, with any uh, open cuts. It might, it might be 25 feet, whichever one it is, we, we need to lengthen that a little bit to stay within their tolerances. So there will be some additional cost for that. We're gonna apply the unit cost for this work for the casing pipe. There's already a unit cost in the bid. We'll just apply that to however much more length we tell them to do. Um, a couple of changes to accommodate the pipeline pegging that Columbia City has requested in the lift station here. Uh, some of the internal piping and valves in the lift station. And then at the discharge manhole, they requested some modifications to that manhole to allow them to install baskets where each pipe comes into the manhole so they can catch the pig when it comes through. Um, and then there's always, there will be additional costs that come up as we go through construction, um, unforeseen conditions. 
Um, and I guess one thing which Alan and I uh, wanted to address was, you know, small cost items, uh, if we need to come back to a meeting of the full commission, or if it's something that we could, at a construction meeting with Bill or Tom or Jim, who've been coming to the meetings, um, receive authorization from them for those, those small additional costs. But I think if it's the $75,000, it's including the $75,000 which the board has technically already approved, I think that would be okay. But I think it's if it something else, I think the entire board would need to approve it. So if it's from the $75,000 work allowance. Which has already been approved. Yep. This is just an allocation of it. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. I'd be in agreement with that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the other... Um, the other item as far as cost was the uh, the lighting for this park and I may actually let um, Jean speak to that a little bit uh, but what we're looking at is um, REMC providing lighting along Rail Connect Drive and also some lighting in between US 30 and the park entrance uh, to you know make the park more marketable uh, improve the appearance make it safer um, and again, this is an item that we held out intentionally, knowing that the commission has worked with REMC in the past, avoiding the middleman and the markups associated with that. So I don't know if Gene, if you wanted to sure. address that a little bit. Just one explanation on that deep line. We, we bury those deep so the electrons don't freeze in the winter. So <laughs> similar to your big comment. So. Is it? Thank you. <laughs> I think you may have this already in your pack, but I included uh, some specifications and a picture of uh, some high pressure sodium lighting out at Park 30 as well as the LED lighting. If you get a chance, you can run out there in the evening and uh, take a look at that. Take a look at that. You can see the differences between the two lights. Um, what was installed out the uh, cul-de-sac is the LED lighting, and um, What's that white stuff in there? man, I don't know, it's gone now. I think most of it's gone now. That that happened to be there one evening. Hasn't left since the middle of November, I don't think. Um, here's a drawing for those of you that. A little plot or a vision challenge there. This may be a test. It's been a test for me. So. I to turn my contacts upside down. Um, we've given you two proposals for um, for the street lighting. Um, one would be we. Let's talk about Rail Connect Park first. Um, the the yellow the the yellow dots are our poles. The blue line is where we propose to put street lighting at. Um, let's talk about Rail Connect Park. We propose eight uh, poles down through there from 600 east to the west. And those could either be LED or high pressure sodium. Those would be on 35 foot fiberglass poles as we've got um, in Park 30 and County Line Road and 700 East. So those would all, all match. Um, and I've given you a proposal that'd be on the second page, on the back side of the page there under um, Rail Connect Park would be the middle section there and we've given you the, the, the option to either purchase the system outright, you pay for the energy and you pay for any maintenance that's incurred on those or the other option is that you lease the system from us and we provide all the maintenance and all that. Now, if you purchase a system, we'll be more than happy to do all the maintenance to it and, and just bill you for it. Really, the only 
issues you have is changing the, the, the lamps once in a while. High pressure sodium seems to go out more often than what it does, but um, it's a 20,000 hour lamp, so you would expect about five years of service out of them. We would charge about $100 to go out and change a, a lamp. Um, but if somebody hits the pole, um, we would do exactly what we do now. We would bill the people that actually hit the pole and break it off. So you don't incur any cost there anyway. So we would do it the same way. So um, it's whether you want to own it and it, it's a little cheaper if you own it, looks like. Um, there's just, um, and then you can provide maintenance or we can own it and provide maintenance and you don't have to worry about any bills coming through the through January by. So the other lights that we've got are, do we own those or do we have a lease? You have a you lease those promise, yeah. yeah. Uh, clear at the bottom of that that proposal page is the six hundred East corridor. Um, that would be five lights to the north of the railroad track and three lights to the south. Um, to the south, I think they're attached to the big transmission poles down through there. Um, we would propose that that just be a lease because you're going to be on our on our facilities on on all those. So there's going to be existing poles. They they won't be the brown uh, utility poles in there or brown uh, streetlight poles. Um, uh, there's just a, a lot of asphalt down through there, so it's kind of difficult to put them where you really want to put them, but uh, the other good thing about north of, of the railroad is there's a lot of light spillover from uh, Farmer's Grain and, and the Old Essex Complex. So um, so that that proposed lease is, is there too, whether you want to, um, those are all month, all these are monthly figures, um, so you can take a look at those and see how that that would best work on those. Any questions on those? So if you get a chance, you can see there is quite a bit of um, high pressure sodium. You get a lot of uh, spillover, a lot of light. Um, um, if, if you got a building two, three, four hundred feet away, you'll get some splash. It'll kind of light that uh, the building wall up. Uh, LEDs are a little more directional, so they only go wherever that LED is pointed. So you don't get quite the spill over the, the additional wash in the area. Um, that was kind of, um, kind of important, I guess, doing the cul-de-sac because we are going back toward more residential area across the street, so so there's not quite the spillover um, of this of the of that lighting um, down the cul-de-sac. So it just LEDs are a little expensive right now. Um, it's like anything eventually they'll get they'll get cheaper, but it is what it is at this time. Gene, I didn't have the privilege or experience to go through SDI like some of these board members, but is there any agreement to lease now and then later on? We say, well, we would rather own those ourselves if we did, or is once you make up your mind, that is set? No, what, what we would do would be if you want to buy those, and it would be whatever the the Cost your our depreciated costs are, and then you take those over. Okay. Yeah. Sure. We will report that out with us. If, if, if they buy it, they're responsible for the the utility charge, the monthly charge. Uh -huh. If they lease it, they're not. Is that correct? If, if they lease it, yeah, they're. It, it's just all. It's all on a monthly you monthly can. cost, right? Would this be something that? Commission should look at it and then kind of come back in a sure. another meeting. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Just what whatever you guys or feel more comfortable with, whatever works out. I didn't. I'm not a financial analyst, so I. I, I didn't throw any. 
cost you said, for that. You said on here the yellow dots were your poles? Yes. And, and the green, and you can see the little green uh, lights along this blue line that goes back into the park. This line up in here, that's a temporary service. That's what those oh, yellow okay. dots are there. I get, I'm, I'm like you, I get confused with that quite, quite often. Where's that? <coughs> the road's actually down here <coughs> along the bottom. So. so that red line is the rail connect drive? That's, it. that's the construction. Uh, that's this the line here is the construction line. The the construction line. service. Oh, those are back. lines you already have in place. Exactly. Now. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. I see, it took me a while not to be confused, but I guess. No, that's fine. Yeah. No. Um, and then there's three lights along 600 East, south of the um, railroad track, and five lights to the to the north. And those will all be on existing poles. <coughs> there is a transformer charge in there. Um, wherever we have a a transformer dedicated directly to this, these lights then there's a $7.50 charge per month for that transformer. If that tra if we take electricity off another transformer that serves somebody else, then there wouldn't be any charge for that transformer. But in the case of the 600 East corridor, we have a transformer charge in there. Same way with the Rail Connect Industrial Park. And we don't have a transformer this, that we can pull off of back there, so we have to install one just for these lights. Yes. I have a question because sure. I just questioned the bill when it came in. All the sliding here that we're paying five hundred some dollars over a, a, a month. Mm -hmm. This isn't leased. This is ours as a county. No, it's all leased. This That's all leased. leased. So what are we paying for here? There, you're paying for seven street lights on county line. You're mm -hmm. paying for three street lights on. 700 East, and you're paying for two lights on Old Business 30. Okay, so we'll still have a monthly bill, okay. even if we lease it. Yes. Yeah. You'll still have that yeah, monthly it bill, but it'll be uh, it'll be another bill. We, I mean, we could put everything on the one bill and you pay it all at one time, but it would be in addition to that, those okay. costs. So even if we lease this stuff, we're still going to have a monthly bill? If you lease it, you would have a monthly bill. If you buy it outright, the only thing you would have would be the monthly energy cost. Okay. Yep. So no matter what, we're going to have a monthly bill. Yeah. Yeah, but I was looking at the $500. We'll get you one another, I'm thinking, so. yeah, yeah, $500. Right, that would still. The number of lights we're looking at almost. That would still be in place there. Yeah. Unless you decide to, yeah. to purchase that outright. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm thinking cost wise, it'd be almost double, a thousand, at least a thousand yeah. to twelve hundred dollars, probably, with the number of lines. Yeah, yeah, you have to go back through here and add mm -hmm. each of these up here. Um, for the lights, long rail connect drive, and and for gateway, um, for Williams Drive. Um, we're going to stick a meter stub up just as a disconnect point. So if any time in the future you want to buy that and, and we can stick a meter in there and just meter the whole system and you'd have the monthly energy charge. So all that's going to be all done up, up, up ahead. So. I kind of like your idea, Tom, about leasing at a later point. Decide whether we want to purchase it or not. Do you want me to cover gateway while we're doing it? Um, why not? Why not? Do you want to do the other thing? Okay. Is there any questions on uh, on these? I would invite you to come out to Park 30 at night, call the sheriff and tell him you're out there just driving around. So, um, but um, it, it's just two totally different lights. So, but you can, uh, the spacing of the high pressure sodium. Is about 270 or 280 along Park 30 Drive. It would be about 250 feet along Rail Connect. So it would be at Park 30, you'll see some um, little darker areas in between the poles. And here you would see just probably more, uh, a more smoother light pattern clear across there. So, what do you recommend us to do? <coughs> I don't know. Um, 
The, the LEDs is kind of like a moon glow when you're out there. High pressure sodium is a little, little brighter, a little, you get more light disbursement. Um, LEDs are somewhat new, but I mean, the, the technology is pretty much proven and all that. They're, as you go along every, every year, there's a whole new set of lights and patterns and, and all that. So. Um, Energy use on the LED, though, I noticed by your figures well, here, is less than half. Less than half, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, it goes from 400, 400 watts to 157. I think Alan and I were talking, you know, if you do go to the LEDs, it kind of, um, it's more high-tech, more modern. Sure. It's, oh, you're green, you know, you're sustainable out there at the park. So. I think you'd go out and look at the difference in the light and you'll make up your mind fairly quickly. Yeah. yeah. So. Neither one of the signs will be lighted. Um, we, we haven't gotten to that point yet. One of the sign manufacturers did ask about lighting the sign. Um, and it would probably, I think it would be a, it, something that would be easy to incorporate into this plan to just add a couple either ground fixtures or something if the sign needs to be internally lit, we could. We can accommodate that as well. The sign on 30, just very quickly, is that is that on state or in dot have to get involved in that, or where is that sign? I see, it's we will keep it off of the in dot right of way, but we'll still coordinate with in dot at least as a courtesy, uh, since that is along US 30, um, and they may have some say in the lighting of that sign. Um, that's right. something that we will coordinate. Once we get ideas from the different sign guys, um, then we have something visual we can go to NDOT with and say, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think if we like this? How close will you let us put this to your right of way? Um, we'll need to, for, for both of those signs, we'll probably need to um, work out an easement agreement uh, with the landowners, um, either with the old Essex facility there uh, the sign at Rail Connect Drive is easy because you own the land there. Mm -hmm. We can just set up an easement for that okay. sign. But the one at 30, um, there will be easement negotiations and also discussions within that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think, uh, you know, with the Rail Connect Park and then the Segway and the Gateway Park, and the idea is to, to bring the information and, and proposals and then the Commission's you know, approval to go forward whichever direction you want to remove. So. We're uh, coming up on 8 o'clock. We did want to introduce another project, the, uh, the Gateway Park uh, facelift, if you will. Um, as we see new interest in Gateway Park, we see some transition in, in some of the building ownership and, and tenants. Um, I asked Jim and, and his team to look closely at what improvements could be made to the park. He's come up with an opinion of costs uh, of some of what the improvements could be. I guess I'll, Jim will ask you to, to say more, but uh, sort of an order of importance, I think, from most important or highest priority to lowest on the, the and this is on the opinion of cost here. The things that the commission can do uh, in terms of signage or, or um, drainage improvements, resealing or, or striking the roads, installing lighting again with REMC, um, really to make this park more presentable and more marketable, um, both as we welcome in you know, new uh, owners or tenants and also the, as we do work with the buildings that will become available in the future. So. You know, again, our, our, our intent today is to bring this to you to the full commission for, for consideration, but then also to spend some time this spring and honing in on exactly what improvements you'd, you'd like to see and make sure we do that in the right way and uh, see what proposals we can put together this year. So, Jim? Thanks, Alan. Um, this uh, opinion and probable cost that Alan mentioned, we tried to um, put together in a logical sequence most bang for the buck ways that you can upgrade the park, improve its marketability, 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 modernize it, um, and just overall make it more marketable for people to come in. Um, what we did is we we took a look at the park. You should have you should all have this aerial here um, to look at and try to identify um, items that aren't huge costs uh, but ways to improve the park. I'm just going to go down this list on the opinion of probable cost 
and describe to you some of the ideas that we that we've come up with. Um, the first two items are signage, uh, wayfinding signage, which would be directional signs inside the park at intersections. So, for example, um, at the intersection with Cardinal Lane, we would have a sign there noting the businesses that you need to turn right on the Cardinal Lane to get to. Same thing for Governor's Drive. Um, it would be kind of similar to the idea of the signs that you've probably seen in downtown Fort Wayne where it says, okay, the, the uh, museum is this way, Parkview Fields is this way, signs like that. And we're, and we're calling that wayfinding signage. Um, no cost associated with that yet because we're working with sign, um, the sign companies to hone in on a cost for that. Uh, <coughs> signage at the entrances. Um, I don't know how often you guys get out there and drive past there, but the signs that are out there right now are deteriorating. Um, they have a list of all the businesses that were in the park whenever the signs were put up. They're outdated. Um, and what we're looking to do there is, similar to at Rail Connect, provide a nice monument sign at the entrance along Lincoln Way, along Business 30, and then also provide a sign at the highway, which is visible from US 30 on the north side of the park to you know, kind of highlight the park. Get people there driving between Columbia City and Fort Wayne to notice that, hey, there is a park there, instead of just driving past and seeing a Safeway sign. Um, really highlighting that. And again, we're looking, we've requested some concepts based on a $15,000 per sign budget. It's just a budget, that's all it is. We're just getting concepts. Once we get the concepts, we can choose a sign designer and, and hone in on whatever cost we feel is appropriate. Uh, so signage is gonna be one of the cheaper ways to improve the park, one of the most high visibility uh, ways to improve the park. Um, lighting is probably going to be the second most important. We actually have that listed down at the bottom, but that should really probably be uh, right up there with the signage. Um, I'm going to leave it down there at the bottom so Gene can talk about that once I get through the other, the other items. Um, we have item number three on the list, talks about swale improvements. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at Williams Drive, which bisects the park, you drive down Williams Drive, you'll notice in this vicinity, there are some pretty big washouts along the road. Um, there may be farther along the road, but when we were last out there, it was snow covered. I couldn't see if there were any other washouts, but we know there are some in this vicinity. Um, that's something that would be inexpensive to, to deal with, and it's something that if a prospective business drives through there and sees that, they might question the maintenance of the park. It's a low-cost item something that we could relatively quickly address, whether with just simply regrading the swales or providing some storm sewers. Um, the cost that you see there, the $65,000, is a conservative cost. That accounts for um, redoing the swales along a good portion of Williams Drive. It may be that we only need to do it along 10 or 15 percent of the length, in which case that $65,000 cost will be significantly reduced. Um, Williams Drive pavement resealing. Um, we could go out there uh, even as early as this year and reseal the asphalt on Williams Drive. Uh, again, last week we were out there it was difficult to assess the pavement because it was snow and ice covered. Um, but I did see some micro cracking uh, in the pavement, and there probably hasn't been done anything done on that for several years. Um, might be a good idea to, uh, to, to, to reseal that. And that would be cheaper than um, going through and actually milling and resurfacing with another layer of asphalt. Now the resealing is only going to last a few years and it'll be a constant maintenance issue, uh, whereas the repaving um, would be a, a longer term solution. Um, and you can, you can see here item four, the resealing, we're estimating that at somewhere around $15,000. If you go down to item seven, the Williams Drive resurfacing, we're estimating somewhere around $80,000. So it's about a quarter, 
about a quarter of the cost um, to reseal, but again, it's probably only going to last a quarter of the time. Uh, those are those are two. Um, they kind of go hand in hand. Two ways to, you know, improve the improve the park. Um, the intersection with Business 30. One idea which has been proposed is at this intersection to actually widen that intersection, maybe provide um, a left and right turn lane out of the park, and maybe even potentially provide an island in the middle of that drive, a curved island, which could have landscaping in the middle, could even have the sign in the middle. Um, the island idea, I would say, would be um, more on the, uh, the outer scope of what we'd want to do, because if we do that, it's going to make it harder for trucks to turn into the park. Depends if we want to make this more of a, uh, a business, commercial park versus industrial. And right now, to me, it, it appears to be a combination of the two with a definite industrial presence. So I think we could leave out the, uh, the curbed island, the boulevard style entrance, and just add a turn lane. If you had to, uh, an island there with landscaping, on it, we'd have a maintenance thing there, yep. but is there an association out there that could take care of that? Well, that's another one of our items. Is the association is, is dormant. So you know, we need to get out, I think, this spring as a group and meet with the park owners and, and get them interested in restarting association, supporting some of these uh, improvements. Um, you know, we can work with, uh, with Andy, I think, to, to restart the association, uh, even update the covenants so they better uh, align with, with what we're looking to, to see as far as the park image and, and presentation. Uh, the park covenants date back to what, 64, mm -hmm. 62? So I mean, a lot different than what you see at, at Park 30 or, or Rail Pack Park. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's some things here we need to do that aren't just the, the kind of hard service, you know, infrastructure improvements as much as, you know, it's working with the owners there and, and getting it to where it's it's truly a 21st century business park that's still very relevant and important to the community. So, can I, if I'd speak to that real quick, I've been looking into the covenant situation a little bit. Um, <clears throat> they used to have an association. The association was. Uh, the actual association was administratively dissolved a number of years ago, so the entity no longer exists. Um, the covenants, which are recorded covenants, which stick with those the land no matter what, are still valid. Uh, the bylaws associated with the actual association are probably not, because that entity no longer exists. So the only thing we have to gov the only thing they would have to govern their processes is the covenants. <clears throat> if you look at this kind of as a, a corporation. You know, each landowner is a shareholder with an equal vote. Um, the the covenants actually say that they shall have an association, so they're kind of in violation of the covenants now without having it. I mean, we can help them. Uh, the uh, redevelopment commission is not a landowner, so we're not going to be involved unless some way we become one. But <clears throat> they're not going to be involved uh, in that governance in any way. Um, and we can talk with the owners and meet with them and you know encourage them if they do this we'll do this um, and being that there are no uh, guidelines under the covenants and if we assume that the bylaws are no longer active Indiana law would say that we only have to get 10% of those owners together <clears throat> to vote <clears throat> to put their what they call a board of control back in place, which would be board of directors, and get the association back up and running again. Probably need to do that. Right. Um, the difficulty I think is going to be with amending the covenants. There, it does address amending the covenants. In the covenants, it says it can be done once every ten years. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it doesn't really address. You know, a lot of times covenants will say these covenants can be amended by 75% of the vote of the members or shareholders, whatever you want to call them. It doesn't say that. Um, I have somebody researching it now. My concern is that amending these covenants is probably going to take 100% of the owners to do that. Because, you know, you buy a piece of land, you get your title report, and you say, okay, I have these covenants, these are the things I can and can't do. We can't just change somebody's rights 
um, and mend the covenants without them agreeing to it because they have that right when they bought that land. Now, I think I've, Alan's told me that maybe there's some people who aren't in compliance with the covenants. That's a different story. The covenants would provide uh, the ability to enforce that and take legal action to enforce them to comply. Uh, but again, there's no association to do that. So I don't know how Alan wants to proceed with doing it and getting the owners together to get the association back up and running again. But um, definitely we can help them do that and even require it if they want us to get involved. The other thing I, Alan asked me to look into, too, was the, the improvements we would do or potentially do at this site. Um, it's, it's more than likely that we would probably based on the, this list, <clears throat> have to go through kind of the same thing we went through with Rail Connect if we're going to do this dollar amount in improvements. The, it's kind of, you know, piecemeal a little bit, but the statute says, the law says, we can't artificially break these things up to avoid coming under that umbrella. So if we're going to do this group of improvements, we'll probably have to go through that process again. Well, that's, uh that I pretend today. No. Yeah. Problem. Probably getting that association going on probably be pretty key to getting the whole thing going. I think what we wanted to accomplish today was just get these ideas before you, uh, give you some food for thought on uh, an overall cost budget for these improvements to Gateway, um, and just kind of point out, you know, the signage, the lighting, improving Williams Drive as the key items that aren't necessarily incredibly high costs that will really help uh, to market Gateway Park. And once we, once Alan and I get some feedback from the, from the sign firms that we've been talking to, we can come back and show you guys the ideas they put together and discuss further at that point in time what we want to do. Um, I would say that on the electrical handout Gene gave you, there's also some costs in there for lighting for Gateway. That's something you can take a look at and, uh, and evaluate when you're looking at Rail Connect as well. Is this all outside the city limits? Is it all Um We proposed 10 lights down Williams Drive. Um, Actually, you don't have that many posts. I'm sorry? You don't have that many posts. You don't have well, we, those would be new posts. We don't have that many poles down through there. We could bury them all, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Can't see the lights that way. Um, there'd be ten lights, and again, there's a little green green dots down through there. Um, if you want to copy that, um, so there's a proposal there uh, on the front for ten poles and lamps, and again, those would be the brown fiberglass poles. There's a second additional proposal on the back to put three additional lights, two on. Is that Cardinal going back to the east and yeah. then one on Governor's Drive and and that would be the one on Governor's Drive would be oh, right here. Um, the, the old Dana building and and um, um, what's the name? Um, electronic shop up. Bacon. Um, that would be right there, their driveway would be where the one would be. And then the one on Williams Drive, and on um, Cardinal Drive, would be near the the two entrances into the, in the old four right boundary building. So that would really light, brighten up that corridor. And I, I uh, yesterday we changed the name on the electric service for that building, so I think things are progressing. but that would provide lighting for people moving back in there. So so that additional cost is on the second page at the top, three poles land. So all that's all underground and uh, and again you got your option of LED or high pressure sodium. Is there anything else that needs to come? Yep.